those are those are bright. Uh, you guys hear me okay? Yes. Cool. All right. Um, how many of you guys have heard me give this talk before? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, for those of you who have heard this, you know that. Uh, thank you, sir. I was gonna need that. Uh, for those of you who have heard me give this talk before, um, you know that I genuinely do not like to do this. This is, you know, her Dr. Wells. Can we just for a second give Dr. Wells a big hand again? Because it takes a lot of time. Uh, you heard him talk about dreading to do this kind of thing. Um, I've spoken in front of tens of thousands of people before. I, I don't necessarily get nervous speaking, but this I hate doing. Um, but I do it because if you're going to be a, a mentor to somebody, you not only need to share the good things and the successes that you've done in life, but you also need to share mistakes and the screw-ups. So because I believe you can learn just as much from, uh, from a mentor teaching you something that they did right or wrong. Either way, you can learn a lot from putting your hand on a hot stove. Can we agree? Yes. <laughs> so um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Virgil. Um, I have, uh, I was the first person in my family to, I was adopted at birth when I was seven days old. Anybody in here adopted? Hand raised. Oh, here's a couple. Cool. Um, I was the first person in my family to, to graduate high school, much less go on to college. Um, and I have led a ridiculously, stupidly blessed life. Move it up. Hang on. Is that better? Is that better? Ten nine eight seven six five four three two one. Bye now. <laughs> um. Like I said, I've led a ridiculously, stupidly blessed life, beyond, beyond, far beyond anything I actually deserve. I am where I am in life. Um, I return. I made my first million when I was 19. I retired for the first time when I was 23. I have retired half a dozen times since. And I'm not telling you that to brag because I'm nothing special. I am where I am in life because of two things, grace of God. And I mean that in the truest possible definition of the word grace because I don't deserve anything that I've got. And the fact that when I was in uh, college, I made a science out of getting billionaires to mentor me. And I am living proof that the stuff that they've been teaching me these last few days works. The stuff that they teach you guys every day, I live in my life every single day. I have bought, been blessed enough to buy and sell a lot of companies. I've done a lot of fun things. But the one thing that I've done consistently for almost 30 years now is I mentor young people. That is my passion in life. I love to do that more than anything else because six billionaires saw something special in a dumb little kid from Iowa. It changed my life for generations and in my family's life for generations. I mean, it's something I can never possibly repay. You guys have heard this word mentor, 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 mentor. If you take one thing away from the talk I'm going to give you tonight, is I want you to understand that mentoring is the ultimate shortcut to anything you want to achieve in life. Okay, Mentoring is the ultimate shortcut to anything you want to change in life, or anything you want to achieve. Because we've all heard that thing, you know, how long does it take to learn from your own mistakes? Lifetime. A lifetime. How long does it take to learn from somebody else's? Lunch. Lunch. Okay. Guys, I got really good at doing this when I was your age. I had no access to mentors. My father was a janitor. He never made more than 12 grand a year. Perfect example of working hard is not the answer. You have to work hard and smart, okay? But nobody taught my dad. He didn't know any different. I mean, I grew up in a very, very close family. Uh, being adopted, I couldn't have picked two better parents if I had a choice. Uh, but we were just dirt poor. And um, how many of you guys have ever had moments in your life, pivotal points in your life, where you can remember them clear, clear as a bell, Okay that th these turning points that if you'd have gone this way or that way, you, you, where would your life be right now? You don't know, okay? We all have moments like that in our lives. And 
two of them for me that I remember growing up was uh, I, I lived on a, um, it wasn't really a farm, but it was something similar to that in Iowa. And we would get to go into town once a month. And we would, the, our, the pinnacle of our whole month was going to eat at McDonald's and then getting to shop at Kmart. And um, we would always go to McDonald's, and, but my dad would always go in and get the food and we would go, he'd bring it back out to the car and we would eat. And I didn't understand why it was at that time until later on that I realized that he was actually so ashamed of how poorly we were dressed that we, we wouldn't go into the restaurant. He would bring it out to the car. And I just thought it was fun because when you're little, you don't know you're poor. And uh, I was like, well, that's cool. You know, you just eat in the car and throw food at each other and all that kind of fun stuff that you do when you're little. And um, then I, so I remember that because I remember thinking there was one time that that happened when I, after I realized why he did it, that, you know, I, I just said to myself, okay, I'm not going to be poor. No matter what, I'm not going to be poor. And, um, and there was another time that we went to Kmart, and remember Kmart was a big deal to us. It was like shopping at you know, Macy's or something for the average person. And I remember one time my father went off to uh, go do something, and I was with my mom. And as soon as my dad left, she went over to the dresses and started holding up dresses in front of the mirror, and you could see her light up, her face light up. And she saw my dad coming and uh, put the dresses away really fast and said, you know, whatever you do, don't tell your dad that I was looking. I don't want him to feel bad. I was like, hmm, okay. Well, my, my, when I get married and I have a wife, she's never going to do that, you know, because I'm, you know, young and think I'm going to take on the world and all this. And so I grew up, you know, I, uh, I grew up believing that money was going to solve everything, that getting rich was going to be the answer to everything. Now, it's not until later on in life when you actually have money that you realize it doesn't do anything like that. But that was my reality at the time. So that's what I went with. And when I went to college, I went with a passion that no matter what, I was going to get rich. You know, for people who don't know me, they think I'm extremely intelligent. People who do know me know I'm anything but. I, what I do have, though, is focus that will burn a hole through a wall. I will not give up when I set my sights on something. And I just knew that I had to be rich. Now, I didn't have any access to mentors. I didn't know what they were. I had no clue. I mean, to give you an idea, you know, one of two things is going to change your life, guys. Inspiration or desperation. One of those two. You know, I love to hear Dr. Bill's story about how he just knew he was going to be a dentist, you know, from the time that he can remember remembering. I mean, that, that's got to be an awesome feeling to know what you're meant to do in life. But for most of us, and myself included, for me it was desperation. I had no clue. How many of you guys out there have no idea what you really want to do in life yet? Okay. Congratulations. You're normal. <laughs> okay. And um, so... When I went to school, give you an idea of how stupid my logic was at the time. The only access I had to any mentors was Forbes and Fortune magazine. And every month when we'd get the new issue in at the library at the university, I'd read it cover to cover. And then I would literally, as soon as they profiled a billionaire, because there weren't that many of them at that time, I would start writing them letters, physical letters. For those of you who are young, it was a time when you actually used to put a piece of pen on a piece of paper, and then you would put this thing in this magic black box, and it would disappear. And... Uh, so I would start writing these billionaires' letters, and it didn't take me long to figure out that didn't work. But I couldn't get to them, but I could always get to their gatekeeper. I could always get to their secretary. And I got really, really good at making them like me and feel sorry for me. And every summer, I would pack everything I had. How many of you guys know what a Pinto is for a car? I was rocking a 1971 pea green Pinto that, back then. And I would pack everything I owned in the car in the summertime, and I would drive to one of their gates until they just let me in to empty garbage cans or clean toilets. I didn't care. I said, get my foot in the door, and I will take care of it from there. And again, because I was just desperate. And again, because six of those guys took me under their wings, um, it changed my life and my family's life forever. First business I ever owned was a mortgage company that a college professor of mine and I started. You guys, they, you, they've talked to you guys right about how important it is to get to know your professors and things like this. I actually made millions of dollars with a professor that we all used to joke about. Call four, we called him four by four because he was four feet tall, four feet wide, and couldn't talk to anybody to save his life. Uh, he was a, a statistics professor. And what happened was at that particular time in Iowa where I was growing up, uh, there was a farm crisis. All the farmers were losing their farms right and left. Um, my uncle lost the family farm, committed suicide. 
because of it because it was a big deal back then for that to happen and it was just it was just the economic times and a lot of other circumstances in place but I had been doing an internship with a financial services firm at that point in time you guys all heard about internships right the power of an internship and so I'd been doing that so I knew the right people this guy had a brilliant idea and between the two of us we ended up opening 32 mortgages offices in 23 towns in 18 months and I went from living in a one bedroom apartment with two roommates so that's three guys in a one bedroom apartment uh, we had bunked water beds thought we were cool as heck and uh, I went from that to having a 10,000 square foot house with an indoor outdoor pool and an indoor outdoor hot tub and a different color Corvette for every day of the week just because I flipping could and I, I mean you talk about I remember when I made my first million my mentors told me they sat me down they said Virgil it's great you're a millionaire wonderful you're 19 mazel tov I said we can teach you how to make money that's easy teaching you how to keep it totally different set of skills I go no I got this a few years later I'm flat broke living back with my parents going what the heck happened because it's a different set of skills it's character that will allow you to keep money which I didn't have at that time to give you guys an idea of just how off track I got when I made money the first time how many guys have ever seen a credit card statement okay you know that little box in the upper right hand side where it says what your minimum payment that month should be okay when I was at my peak my minimum payments on my credit card, not my balances, just the minimum payments were between thirty and forty thousand dollars a month. I was out of control. And I mean, all of a sudden you have all these friends around you that you think are friends. And in that particular time, because it was a really good media story, college professor teams up with young whiz kid and they save the farms. I mean, I was all over the news, all over everything, and I mean I really started to think that I was all that and that you know I was basically invincible and uh, so what happened was uh, right at the peak of it we got approached long story short by a bunch of investors from a different country that wanted to buy the company and you know I'm Virgil I know how to do this I don't need an attorney yeah that didn't really work out too well bottom line is uh, uh, our names were still on everything my partner's names were still on everything the these they took millions of dollars out of escrow accounts bankrupted the company left us holding the bag and I went literally from having everything to nothing in a matter of just a few weeks and it was it was hard on me and my ego but it was how many guys come from a small town Okay. my graduating class was 57 kids okay it was devastating on my parents they went from having this young whiz kid that they were so proud of to all of a sudden not even be able to hold their head up in public and that hurt me more than anything and uh, it was really rough because when you don't come from money and you make money the first time there's a part of you inside that thinks you just got lucky and you're never going to be able to do it again and when you see the shame and embarrassment and things that you bring your family over that and you realize that all the friends you had on the way up are not only not there on the way down they turn on you on the way down and all of a sudden you get to a point where you feel utterly completely alone and uh, for me rock bottom or what I thought was rock bottom at that time was a night uh, I, it was the night before they came and took my house and uh, so I'm sitting alone in my house everything's gone I'm sitting up in my bedroom on the floor they had taken all the cars taken everything else and I was sitting there with a gun in my mouth and uh, give you an idea how, how screwed up you could, your thinking can get when you get to that point the only reason I didn't kill myself that night was because I thought to myself I was mad and I thought you know what I'm gonna do it anyway so why don't I take out all the people that have turned on me before I do that I figured I'd go on a spree <laughs> I mean that that's how utterly messed up I was and um, how many of you guys ever saw a movie um, I always forget this um, Jim Carrey uh, Bruce, was it Bruce Almighty right 
where do you guys remember a scene where he was standing uh, on the side of the, I think it was the side of a lake, and he had lost everything, and he looked up to God, and he said, you know, oh, mighty smiter or something like that, smite me, this kind of thing. He dared God to take him down. Well, I, I actually did that that night. I was raised in a church when I went to, I mean, I had like 12 years of perfect attendance, even though no matter how many times I stuck my finger down my throat, my dad still made me go. And, uh, you know, and when I got to college, I ran as far and fast away from God as I possibly could. And that was the moment when I, 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 I was just angry at the world. And so I looked up and I literally, I said, I said God, and I said that loud. I took the gun out of my mouth and I said, God, this is all you got? I'm still here. I said, come on, I dare you. What else you got? And if I could give you guys one piece of advice uh, moving forward in life, don't dare God. <laughs> Turns out he can be pretty creative when he wants to be. And uh, three days later, I had a heart attack. I was 23. Uh, had no idea where it came from. I was, I was, I mean, I was teaching martial arts at the time. I was actually in the middle of a fight when it was going on. And I, all I remember is the whole left side of my body going numb and thinking, dang, he's fast. I didn't even see that coming. And it just dropped. And that started a whole different chapter of my life. Because like I told you guys, beginning, uh, I was adopted at birth when I was seven days old. Uh, I grew up knowing uh, I was adopted. Never, you know, I also had brown eyes. I mean, it never meant anything. I knew, I knew I was adopted before I even knew what the word meant. So it didn't really mean anything to me. Um, but when I had the heart attack, I had to go find my birth parents because they didn't know what had happened, what was causing it for sure. And, uh, you know, when you go to a doctor's office when you're adopted, you know, they have the medical, you know, they have those medical forms where they ask your medical history for everything. Well, when you're adopted, you don't know. So you just go adopted and that's it. You don't even give it a second thought. It wasn't until just, you know, a few years ago that science realized there's over 6,000 diseases that are hereditary. And the scary thing for adopted people is that most of those will skip a generation before they reappear. And so you can be perfectly healthy and all of a sudden, you know, pass something on to your kids or whatever it is and just not know it. And that was, that was my case. But um, I didn't know that at the time. And so I had to embark on this you know, journey to go find my birth parents. Now, honestly, I was never one of these adoptees who laid awake at night and wondered where my, you know, birth parents were. I figured I got two. I don't need two more. And, uh, you know, on, the, on my birthday, I think every once in a while you'd wonder, you know, does the woman even remember it, you know, or something like that. But that was just like a, you know, fleeting thought. I'd always been told I was a product of a rape. That my mom was 15. Nobody knew who my dad was. And, I just grew up knowing that. It didn't emotionally scar me or anything. But my, my, I had great mom and dad. And they made up for anything that, you know, let, that may have been, you know, a hole there. And uh, so, you know, it was one of those things where I just really didn't think about it that much. But all of a sudden, when I had to do it, um, I approached it like I had done everything in my life. For those of you guys, you, you all went through DISC, right? Okay. Uh, my DISC results is there's D. There's 100% D, there's jerk, and then there's me. I'm pure D. And so I approach everything like a mission. There's just an on and off. I don't have a dimmer switch. There's an on and off, and that's with me. So, okay, this is my goal, must find birth mother. No emotions, didn't allow anything in, and just said, okay, I got to do this. And so I, I just plowed through and did it. And there was a moment where all of a sudden, I had her phone number, and it was just bizarre. It was like I'd stuck my finger in a light socket. I couldn't move. All these emotions that I never knew were there just started flooding in, and I probably sat there for at least a half hour just stunned and literally was couldn't move. So finally, I get up the courage to pick up, to pick up the phone and dial it. And guys, you got to remember, this was before caller ID or anything like that. And so... I, I pick up the phone and I'm frozen. And the phone rang probably at least literally a couple hundred times. I'm not exaggerating, it was a couple hundred times because I, I couldn't put the phone down, I couldn't move. And all of a sudden this lady picks up the phone on the other end. I didn't say a word. She picks up the phone. Oh, I hate doing this. And she's, she picks up the phone and she's crying hysterically into the phone. Now, I hadn't said a word. She couldn't possibly know it was me. 
And it turns out it was not my birth mother. It was her sister. What had happened was, again, I was always told I was a product of a rape. In reality, it turns out my parents were married. I had a full-blooded sister that I didn't know existed. That was three years older than me. Uh, but what had happened was my father, my birth father, uh, died when he was 23, like the, like the day after I was born, of a heart attack, the same heart attack that I had had. And so this, this was in Michigan in 1965, and the state of Michigan stepped in. My parents were Harley bikers. And uh, so the state of Michigan stepped in and said, okay, well, here's an unwed woman with a three-year-old and a newborn. We're going to take the newborn, put him in foster care, and come back when you get a job. I, I looked into it later as I was doing my research, and she came back seven days later with a job to get me, but I'd already been adopted out into Iowa. So in her eyes, all those years I was stolen. But she was very poor and from a lower economic status and didn't know how to fight the system. And so all those years, she just had a stolen son in her life. Turns out uh, what she did was she never got remarried, but she moved to the next small town over in Michigan from where I was born and where she was living at the time. Her sister still lives in the same town. And so what she did was for 23 years, she had a phone in her sister's house. <coughs> listed in her name so that in case that phone. <sighs> in case that phone ever rang, it was me. Now. And 23, so she paid that bill every month, month after month for 23 years. And the reason it took my aunt so long to get to the phone was because in 23 years, that phone got buried, you know, amongst all kinds of other stuff in a corner. So it took her 100 rings or so even to figure out what it was. And then she's doing this mad dash for the phone so that she could pick it up before I hung up because there was no such thing as caller ID back then. And um, so it, it, it was... It was pretty interesting. Turns out my birth mother set a plate for me at the table every night. You know, I had birthday parties for me, all that kind of stuff, even though I never existed. Oh, I hate doing this. Excuse me. And um, it was just, it was, it was a very, very difficult situation for her. Now, Uh, so I, I ended up meeting her. Uh, she was in Michigan. I was in Iowa, and it was the middle of summer, and so we kind of met halfway outside of Chicago at a truck stop just off the interstate. It was probably at least 100 degrees that day, high 90s, whatever it was, and um, so I get out of the car, and they're probably a couple hundred yards away. My full-blooded sister, not a half-sister, a full-blooded sister, and she start walking towards me. Now, what I did not know at that time, keep in mind, I was 23 at that time. Her husband, my birth father, was 23 when he died. What I did not know was that if you were to put a black and white picture of me next to a black and white picture of him when he died, I would have a hard time telling him apart. I had the same big handlebar mustache. I mean, it was just crazy. And so what happened was, as we were walking towards each other, as soon as her face could focus on my face, she was emotional to begin with, and somehow in her mind she got it twisted around that I was her dead husband that came back to life, and she freaked out and dropped like a sack of potatoes on the asphalt. We had to get an ambulance and everything to come get her and take her to the hospital and all that stuff. And I told her when we were in the hospital later, I said, you know, I usually don't have that effect on women until after they meet me followed by the nausea and the vomiting, but I've, been, I've gotten used to that. And uh, so it's been, that's been an interesting journey. Um, the coolest part of the whole thing was literally to have a full-blooded sister because you're genetically identical, but you don't have any of the crap of growing up together. So it's really kind of cool. Um, 
But that leads me to what I'm, the next part of my story I'm going to tell you, and that is what I consider to be probably the biggest screw-up in my life. During the time that this was going on, and a few years earlier than that, I had run into a man who was a mentor of mine. His name was Walter Haley. He is the gentleman who actually started this entire program over well over two decades ago. And uh, he was a very pivotal, pivotal, important person in my life who changed my life in a lot of ways. And I worshiped the ground that man walked on. He was one of the kindest, most uh, gentle, giving people you'd ever meet. Funny as heck. And um, what he had done, he used to have these um, get-togethers at his house once a year. I think it was either Fortune or Forbes magazine used to do a profile on it almost every year where he would take Fortune 500 CEOs and bring them all to his house. And he lived on top of this mountain. He had his own zoo. You'd drive past elephants and giraffes and stuff walking by. I mean, the guy was just insanely successful. And uh, he would bring these CEOs up there for a weekend. I was the only one that wasn't on that level that was allowed to come. And so I was sitting on these meetings. And uh, after a few days, Walter would always end it by he'd get all these big time, you know, captains of industry standing out in a circle in his driveway. And he would tell a story about him and his father. Walter had a really messed up life and turned it around just, again, out of desperation. And he told the story about his father and how one time he decided he was going to stop hating his father and holding it against him. And he sat down and he wrote his father a letter of all the things that he was grateful for that his father did for him. Walter would... It was amazing to watch him tell this story. How many of you guys ever saw the cartoon Mr. Magoo? I guess I'm getting old. You know, he looked he looked like a raisin, basically, like about a five foot tall raisin. And one of these men that was just you, you'd fall in love with him in the first fifteen seconds you met him, and in one minute he was the best friend you ever had in your life. And uh, he was just that kind of guy. And as he was telling this story, you would see these captains of industry just break down like babies on, on their knees in this man's driveway and start crying. And the, the, the purpose of his message was to tell them to go back and write a, uh, write a thank you letter, to be grateful to all the people who helped them get where they are in life, to their parents, not to hold any grudges and all this kind of thing. And with Walter, again, if he told me to jump, I said how high. I didn't I didn't question anything. I just did exactly what that man told, and he was never wrong. I did, took every piece of advice he gave except that one. And for whatever reason, you know, I, year after year, I would come, and I would hear him tell that story, and as soon as he started telling that story, I started backing up, and I got out of there. And I, I don't, there was no baggage between my father and I, there was no, or my parents, there was nothing like that. But for whatever reason, maybe it's just because I'm such a big D, I didn't want to, you know, face emotions like that. And so I just never wrote the letter. Every year Walter would say, did you do it yet? And I'd be like, I'm going to. And he'd look at me, you better. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. So year after year after year, I, I just never did it. And... Uh, you, know, you talk about moments in your life that change everything. When I was living back with my parents, um, you understand, as I was growing up, my father was a German immigrant. My, both my mom and dad were fresh off the boat, spoke German in our house more than we ever spoke English. Uh, my father was a huge man. I mean, he had, his hands were the size of my head, and just a big, giant teddy bear. But, I mean, very intimidating to look at him. He never spoke. He always, because he had a, he had a sixth grade education, he always thought people thought he was stupid, so he would never talk. And so he and I kind of had this unwritten language where, you know, I was like, by the time I was five, I knew that mm meant yes and mm meant no. 
and that's he. I don't think he and I, up until uh, one particular night, I don't think we ever spoke 500 words to each other. But we didn't need to. We had this little language that we would do. My fondest memories growing up as a kid were sitting at the base of a waterfall with him fishing for hours. And uh, he never didn't have to talk. It was just really kind of a neat relationship. And uh, so in the course of when I had to go look for my birth mother, you, th there was a time when you know, my parents were always really, really supportive. Of it. They understood it. They got it. Um, they didn't feel threatened by it, or I didn't think. And uh, so it was really, really neat. One day my mom, one, out, one night my mom went out to uh, go get some groceries and left my dad and I there by ourselves. And uh, my dad sat me down. And I remember my dad never, ever sat me down in my lifetime. So he sits me down at the kitchen table and he's all serious. And he goes, um, he says, I need to ask you a question. And I said, Okay. And uh, he goes, you know, your mom and I were talking about something the other night. And he said, he said, I know the answer to this, but I just need to hear it from you. It's like, okay. Because I was in the process of looking for my birth mother at the time. And he said to me, he goes, he says, when you find this woman, does that mean you're not ours anymore? I just kind of blew it off, and I said, Dad, yeah, of course. What the heck? Yeah, obviously, yeah. He's like, yeah, I thought so. I thought so. I just needed to hear it from you, and I'll tell your mom. I said, okay, cool. And there was something. There was something really magical about that night because I gotta remember to take decongestants before I do this sometime. I'm sorry, this is really rude, but uh, ma'am, sorry. <laughs> um, <coughs> so there was something really magical about that night because, for whatever reason, that just opened this door, and. All of a sudden, it's like we were college buddies. I mean, we started talking about everything. We talked for hours. I mean, my dad went down the refrigerator and got a beers for us. I didn't even know he had beer. In the, I'd never seen him drink. And we started drinking together and hanging out. I mean, we were just talking. We talked about girls. We talked about everything. It was just absolutely Magical is the only word that describes it. And I like, I remember my mom came home. And remember, I, I told you up to that point, my, my dad and I probably never said 500 words to each other. So she comes home, and she sees this going on, and she doesn't know what the heck. She's like, she goes to bed. We're still talking. An hour later, she gets up and looks down the hall, shakes her head. We're still talking. I mean, we're laughing and joking. I mean, it was, it was incredible. So I remember, I remember going to bed that we, we stayed up all night, all night talking. And I remember going to bed that morning, thinking to myself, I was remembering Walter's words. It was like December 4th, December 5th, something like that. And I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be so cool. I'm going to write him and mom the letter of a lifetime. I, got, I figured I'm going to give it to him for a Christmas present. So I've got you know, roughly three weeks to do it. I got time to craft it, make it perfect, you know, on and on. I'm just gonna hit it out of the park at Christmas time. And uh, three days later, he was killed in a car accident. Thanks, sweetie. That's my daughter. Uh, by the way, I never let my kids hear this until they're at least 12 years old. Um, 
you guys all met my son Adam, I'm sure over time this is, he turned 12 a few weeks ago, so this is his first time in hearing this. And uh, so three days later he was killed in a car accident. So I never got to, I never got to write him the letter. So time goes on and you would think that as a reasonably intelligent person, at some point I would realize that I still have another parent left and I could maybe write my mom a letter, but I didn't. And uh, my, a few years later, my mom got remarried to my dad's best friend. Uh, he had lost his wife a few years earlier to cancer. And I mean, this I grew up, they were our next door neighbors. I grew up with them and I remember my mom being all nervous when she called me to tell me that she was seeing Warren was a big deal and I was like come on you kidding me this is fantastic I couldn't ask for somebody better for you two to be they don't they grew up in high school together they all came over to the states together from Germany it's perfect uh, this is great and so they got married and time goes on and a few years later years later uh, I'm living in Florida at that time and I get a call from Warren her husband that my mom had a heart attack they didn't expect her to make it through the night and that I should get on a plane So I get on the plane and I'm, the only thing I'm thinking in my mind at that time is I got to, I got to write this letter and get it to her before it's too late. So um, thank God it was dark on the plane. Um, because I'm sitting there trying to write this thing out as fast as I possibly can, crying like an idiot, and think kicking myself for being a, such a stubborn dumbass. <laughs> so I get up the plane, go to the hospital. I don't know if you ever, how many guys have ever seen somebody who's just had a heart attack, but I mean, there's just tubes sticking out of everything, and um, it's. I, I see blood and I pass out. I'm, I'm a wuss. And so I go charging into the room, you know, trying to beat the clock. And uh, Warren and the doctors grab me on my way in and say, okay, it looks like she's pulling out of it. It looks like she, she might make it. Um, I'm like, okay, great, but I, I got to do this. I got to do this. So I, I go in there and she's just white. I mean, whiter than I've, I mean, it's completely pale. And she's unconscious. And the doctors are trying to tell me she's going to last another, at least another day. I'm like, okay. So um, I go back home that night and uh, try to polish the letter up a little bit more. Get there the next day. Now, you'd have thought after everything that I'd just gone through that I'd be smart enough to give her the stupid letter, but I didn't. When when I got there, she was you know, in fairly bright spirits and things were looking much better. And I figured, okay, I'll have a few more days to do this. I'll, I'll sit down and, and write it. And I ended up staying there for probably three or four weeks until she recovered and went back to Florida and never gave her the letter. So a few more years go by. I'm going through an old sock drawer one day and I, I find this letter that I had written. I mean, it's just, I mean, it was just a disaster. And I mean, there was just, every, all the ink was smudged and because I, I literally cried all over it as I was writing it. And uh, so it was the beginning of August. My mom's birthday is August 7th. And uh, I was thinking, you know what? I got a few days. 
I'm going to really do this right. And so I just blocked out everything, and I wrote a killer letter. It was really good. And um, I waited till August 6th because I figured I'm going to overnight it. She's going to get it. Let's see. She's going to get it at 10 a.m. She's going to cry till 1030. She's going to call me at 1045, and I am super son for the rest of the life. My sister's going to hate me. I have an adopted sister who's older than me. <laughs> and uh, so I got the letter all done. August 6th, I throw it in the mail. You know, put it in the FedEx box, and it was like this massive weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I'm thinking, yeah, I finally did it, finally did it, finally did it. So next morning comes, I'm, I'm sitting there, okay, she should have got it right around now. She's probably crying, so she should call any minute. So 10.30 comes, no call. 11 o'clock, no call. 12.12. No call. About 4 o'clock, I get a call from Warren, her husband. She got the letter. Uh, but she got so emotional reading it that she had another heart attack. So I'm back on the plane thinking, great, you killed your mom. Wonderful. Just kicking myself for being so freaking selfish and stupid. Get on the plane, get up there. Get in the hospital room. She's still alive at the time. She's laying there in the bed. got her Bible in one hand uh, and she's got this letter I mean like completely clenched in her hand yeah. she said to me she said when I die she says I want you I want you to read that at my funeral. Because, and she's holding it, because this is proof that your dad and I did something right. Uh, she's still alive to this day. I mean, she, she didn't die or anything, and we laugh about this now. <laughs> but to this day, that is that letter is her prized possession. She's had copies made. They're laminated. She's got it in her safe deposit box. She's got it in her Bible. I mean, she's got them everywhere. And uh, you know, there's there's no manual to being a parent. Some of the most important things that you need to know in life, there's no instruction manual for. It seems crazy, but until you have a kid, you don't really understand. You know, you go through your whole life, and you don't know if, you, if you're doing a good job. There's no grades you get as a parent. That makes sense. And so, you know, for those of you in here who think you know what love is, until you look in your child's eyes for the first time, you have no idea. People always told me that when, oh, wait till you're a parent, wait till you're a parent. Trust me, there's nothing you could do that could explain what it's like to look into your child's eyes for the first time. And then to think you have all that responsibility and nothing to go by, except most of us just go by as parents. We go by what we were taught by our parents, as an example. And... Uh, When you see the impact that a letter like that can do in someone's life, 
you know, parents go their whole lives not knowing if they've ever done a good job or not. Everybody in this room, at one point or another, has probably hated your parent. And I'm not going to ask you for a raise of hands. But let me tell you something. Again, they don't have a manual for what they're doing. They're not perfect. But I can guarantee you one thing, that they love you. And if you're sitting in this room right now, there is somebody in your life who loves you, that has sacrificed for you, probably much more than you possibly know. Because one thing parents are usually pretty good at is hiding the sacrifices that they make for their children. And you, if I could give you one piece of advice, it would be let the people in your life who care about you know how much you care about them, how grateful you are for them. Guys, I've been mentoring kids for almost 30 years now. I'm almost 50. And I see kids like you holding on to grudges and crap in your lives and things against your parents that just don't matter. Yeah, they weren't perfect. Yeah, they screwed up. Yeah, maybe they did all kinds of horrible things. But bottom line is, they, they sacrificed for you on one level or another. And I promise you that they do not know if they've done a good job. So you need to understand that there is urgency to doing this. Do not screw up like I did. I wrote my dad a letter years later. I took it to his grave. They said it would help. Nope. It's not the same. It's not the same at all. So if you've got a parent or parents or anybody in your life who you care about, go out of your way to make sure. Put all the crap that's happened in your life away and just let them know how much you care. If you can't think of one good thing about your parent, think harder for anything. When Walter wrote his letter, his dad abused him in every imaginable, imaginable way for years. And he still found things to be thankful for. You don't have an excuse. You know, I don't know what your particular religious bent is, but the Bible promises a lot of things, us a lot of things. What it does not promise us is tomorrow. Do not think you have time, extra time to do this. Any little, just sit and write them a letter. Tell them all the good, all, the way you do this, guys, it's really simple. Just picture all those moments in your life that you learned something from them, good or bad, and thank them for it. The fact that you'll even remember some of those times will mean an infinite amount to them. I guarantee you, no matter how screwed up your relationship is, that letter will heal it. It will take your relationship to a new level that you can't even possibly imagine. But you have to take the step. Don't hold grudges. No matter what happens in your life, it's over. You make your decisions. You make your choices from here on out, starting right now. And you, all of you have something to be thankful for. I'm going to tell you one last story, and then I'm going to let you guys go. I told you earlier that you you never know how much time you have. I've been teaching at LEAP from the time that when it was originally formed for almost three decades now. And I have an infinite amount of respect for Dr. Bill for the sacrifices that he makes to help you guys get here. One year, um, I don't know you guys probably know my two daughters are here, Jessica and Jamie. Jessica's uh, just turned 16. Jamie is 14. And um, one year when Jessica and I were traveling here, because both my girls have been coming to this program since they were about five. 
they've been passing out papers for me. They were my, they were my little assistant. They were bored to death the first few years they were here. And um, they've learned to, they are walking, talking examples of what we teach here. I don't remember if Jessica was five. I think she's probably six, six at the time, if I can remember right, five or six. We were flying here to Los Angeles. And um, guys, I've been, I've been a pilot for 20 some years and a flight instructor for probably almost 20 years. And uh, we, were on a we were on a commercial airline coming here. And uh, it was just her and I. I thought it was a cool little daddy thing to do. And uh, we get over LA and uh, pilot comes on and says, uh, we're gonna circle around a couple more times. There's just a couple mechanical issues we're dealing with. Just you know, sit tight, we'll have you on the ground in a few minutes. Okay. Circle around a little bit. Comes on about a half hour later. Uh, we have some uh, little, few more ser serious mechanical problems. We're having a couple technical difficulties with the landing gear, but we're working on it. Uh, just sit tight. Okay. Stuff happens. There's always redundancy in aircraft. I mean, there's always multiple safety systems. As a pilot, I know that. I'm not stressing. Pilot comes on. It's probably a half hour later. At this point, we've been circling for a long, long time. And uh, said, I uh, want to let you know that we have not been able to solve the mechanical problems on the plane. The landing gear will not come down. And so we are going to have to make an emergency landing. And um, now as a pilot, I know the statistics on this kind of thing. And uh, we, we went through the whole thing and he said, well, now what you, if, you, if you look out your window, you're gonna see a lot of flashing lights and things like that. Don't worry, they're here to help. Uh, we're gonna have to, what it's called belly landing the plane. You basically skid in. And this is a commercial airline. And I know the statistics on what the chances are in those situations, and they're not good. So the pilot at one point said, uh, you know, we're going to open it up if, you, if any of you have cell phones, because this was not everybody had cell phones at that time. Uh, I said, if you have any cell phones and you'd like to call your loved ones, we would encourage that now. Interesting. You want to see a plane full of people lose their, it was unreal. The, one of the stewardesses got on a cell phone and she was saying goodbye to her husband in front of everybody. People lost it. I mean, people throwing up, people getting sick. I mean, it was, it was everywhere. It was, it was just crazy. And um, my daughter's sitting next to me. She looks up at me like only a you know, six-year-old can. She goes, Daddy, are we going to be okay? I'm like, yeah, sure, honey. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. So let's call Mom. <laughs> okay. So we called, and uh, she wasn't home. So we had, <laughs> had to leave a message. Now, that's a fun message to leave on an answering machine. So anyway, this was, we were on our way to, to, to what was Leap at that time and uh, left the message. Uh, I don't even really remember exactly what I said, but I'm sure it was not eloquent. And um, landed in, I mean, it was, everybody survived and it was fine, but it was, it was pretty interesting. And to this day, I don't think Jesse even remembers it. And. Uh, what I forgot to do was call back after we landed. <laughs> and my cell phone battery had died <laughs> during that period of time. So I, I had some splaining to do <laughs> later. But the point is, guys, you, at your age, you think you're invincible. You do. You think you're going to live forever. Most of you have no sense of mortality in your life. And I'm telling you, you never know when people don't, pe 
tens of thousands of people die every day. Do you actually think they wake up in the morning thinking this is going to be my last day on earth? They never do. So if you leave this earth tomorrow, I want everybody in your life to know how much you care. Guys, when I was your age, I would have killed to have something like this. For how many, how many of you guys in here, is this your first time? Okay. How many of you guys in here, is this, is this something different than you thought it was going to be before you showed up? Okay. Guys, I've been doing this almost three decades now, working with kids. It's my passion. And so my job is not to make you feel good. My job is to tell you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. Fair enough? Let me tell you what happens. If you leave here and you do not form very close bonds with the people in your group, if you do not hold yourselves accountable to each other with your goals and everything, if you do not stay in touch, and when anybody in your group has a bad day, you rally around them. When anybody has a great day, you congratulate them, but you bond together. If you don't do that, within two weeks, you're going to be the same person you were when you walked in here. You're going to go right back to that same group of friends. Have you heard a little thing about Turkey? You're going to go right back to them. And within six months, this is going to be a fond little memory of a fun weekend you had in California. And nothing will change in your life. How many of you think that you could go back home and even remotely explain what you're experiencing here right now? It's virtually impossible. How many of you think people would understand it? Could you possibly communicate in words all the things and the experiences that you're having here? No. So what you need to do is you have to stay in touch with the people who are here. Hold yourselves accountable. Build each other up. You share your goals so that everybody in your group knows. Build an extraordinary life. If you go back to your friends, nothing's going to change. You have to continue. This is a group that I promise you, if you take this seriously, it will absolutely transform your life. Now, if this is your first year here, guys, this is like trying to drink out of a fire hose. I mean, you're getting so much information so fast that a lot of it isn't even sinking in. The magic in this course happens when you get home. The magic happens when you stay in touch with your friends and you go through all those ups and downs together. I can tell you, having done this almost three decades, you will make friends here that will last a lifetime. And I mean friends. I mean friends who will be there through the ups and the downs. You know, it, it's not uncommon at all for people to meet their spouse here. At all. There are weddings all the time from people who met each other here and got married. How many of you guys remember Chloe? Australian? You know, my, my daughter just went to Sweden and, and attended her wedding uh, to Rick, a guy she met. She's Australian and he's from Sweden. And I mean, talk about a couple. I mean, it's, it's amazing the connections that you can make here. And I, I, I can't state enough how much this course can change your life if you take it seriously. We can't ram this down your throat. you got to want it. And you know what? If, if, the, if, if you think for a second, how many of you guys think that this course has the potential, honestly, to change the course of your life forever? Okay, then I'm going to ask you for one challenge. Next year, bring somebody with you. Next year, take somebody you care about and bring them with you. Can I get you to promise me that? I'm sorry? Yes. What? Yes. Okay. Guys, I said in the beginning of this talk, I don't like doing it. And I'm, by now, you probably all realize I meant what I said. I do not talk about this outside of anywhere outside of Lee. I never do. The reason I say this and the reason I go through this is simply because if it will help one of you, just one person out there, avoid the stupid mistakes that I made in my life, then doing this was worth it. And that's all I got.